Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to John chapter 14 and verse 6 to begin with. And going through the L's on the titles of Christ, we come to life. Christ the life. When we say Christ, we say life. Now it's interesting when you try to define life without using the word life. <laughs> what is life? You say, well, it's existence. Nothing would be unless it was brought into existence. But it's much more than that. Some say, well, it's a state of vitality. If it's moving, then uh, it has life. And certainly there are synonyms for the word life that refer to the spirit, to breath, the very breath of God. It says that God in creation breathed into Adam's nostrils and he became what? A living being, which means before that he was just dust. So that's what we're going to look at here. How is Christ the life? Seems like a simple subject, doesn't it? But very profound when we get into studying it further. Here in John chapter 14 is a good summary of what the Lord told his disciples. He was preparing them for going to the cross. And that's really what he's talking about here in verse 1 of chapter 14 when he says, Let not your heart be troubled. Why would they have been troubled? Well, he had just told Peter that before the cock crew that Peter would deny him three times. So that was troubling. And yet he says, ye believe in God, believe also in me. What's he stating? That to believe in God is to believe in Christ. And those who don't believe in Christ don't believe in God. Doesn't matter what name they give to him if it's not Christ it's not God and if, if it is God then it's Christ his beloved son and when he says there in verse 2 in my father's house are many mansions that's an old English word actually that had to do with dwelling places but you notice in my father's house he's describing there a spiritual house with many dwelling places rooms Plenty of room, but no vacancy, just like on the ark. And he says, if it were not so, I would have told you. Here's Christ in the flesh, God in the flesh. As they looked upon him and listened to him, they're actually looking at a man and needing to be reminded that he is God in the flesh speaking with him. That's the only way that God could ever address a sinner. I believe that was the case when Moses was up on the mountain for those 40 days and he spoke with God as a, as a friend with a friend. He was speaking with Christ because there was no way, even as later God told him when he asked to see his glory, he said, no man can see my face and live. He put him in the cleft of the rock. Another picture of Christ. But he said, I go to prepare a place for you. He's not talking about going up into heaven and preparing all these dwellings and places. Notice I go to prepare a place for you. Well, where was he going? He was going to the cross. And that's where salvation was to be worked out. That's where life was to flow forth for that people that the Father had given to his Son. There's a person and there's a place. The person is Christ. The place is Calvary. That's where God put his son to death that he might be just to justify. But he says, if I go, or since I am going, might be another way to read that, and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. What's he talking about coming again and receiving them? He's talking about his resurrection. That such would be the satisfaction of God the Father in his death, that he could not remain in the grave. It would be impossible for his soul to see corruption. That's the way it's written there in the Old Testament. But he'd come again and what? Receive you unto myself. That was the only way that sinners could ever be received, even as we began our time of worship. 
Christ receiveth, what, sinful men. And make the message clear and plain. So if we've been received, it's by Christ unto God the Father because he's made us accepted in that beloved one, but it's because there's been a sacrifice that has been made and God has been satisfied and by the resurrection of Christ, we know that everyone for whom Christ died, they are justified. He was delivered up, Paul says there in Romans, for our offenses and was raised again for or because of our justification. So anybody that tries to put justification anywhere else but at the cross, they've missed it. But he says, whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. He's been talking to them about his death and how he would go to Jerusalem and be delivered up into the hands of the religious leaders of that day, but they still were hard of hearing. So Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? And that's where we see this clear declarative statement of Christ. I don't know of any that's more clear in all of Scripture as to who he is. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and there it is, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then he says, if you had known me, which means they still needed to learn of him and who he is. See, this takes completely off the table that question that so many people struggle with. And I was talking to somebody this week about that. How much do you need to know to be saved? How many times has that been brought up? It's not on our knowledge. It's on Christ having known those that the Father had given him. And by his knowledge, is the way it's written there in Isaiah 53, shall my righteous servant, what, justify many by his knowledge. I can rest in that. So even here, yes, the Lord is chastising them, but he's not turning his back on him when he says, if you had known me, ye should have known my father also. But he says, and from henceforth, ye know him and have seen him. Bringing them back to who he is. Oh, how we need to be brought back to who he is. Because I'll tell you, this old heart will deceive us every time. We begin to look inwardly. We begin to question by our experiences whether we're the Lord's or not. That's quicksand if you ever get caught in that trap. Now, we're to look to Christ and rest in his work and what he's accomplished. And so Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? The reason I've read that entire context is because when it speaks of Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, we're seeing him as God himself, God in the flesh. That's who he is. He's the source of eternal life. Without him, there is no eternal life. And Christ said there in John 10, 28, that He's the one that gives eternal life, that sinners should not perish. He's the bread of life. He's the, the water of life. He told Martha in John 11, he's the resurrection and the life. So any one of those we could go to and spend the entire time looking at, but the Lord has directed me to focus here on John 14, 6. Christ, the way, the truth, and the life here he identifies himself as the only way to the father emphasizing that true life is found in him alone and that's what it takes it took christ giving his life that those for whom he died might have life and that by his spirit life is given to be brought to christ and to know him You'll notice here that this declaration of Christ features 
three different affirmations, unlike any others that you might find elsewhere in Scripture, and, and these are what are called the I am statements. When Christ said, I am, he's identifying himself with God, as God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So don't just read lightly over the I am's here where Christ said, I am the way. Well, he's identifying himself as God. I am the truth. I am. And I am the life. Notice definite articles. So the truth here that Jesus is the way to God is saying that he is God. And that echoes the same I am statements that you find in John 10 where he says, I am the door and I am the shepherd of the sheep who gives his life for the sheep. There is only one God. People can say all they want to about, well, you know, each person has their view of who God is and so it really doesn't matter. Yeah, it does. There's only one God it's what Paul wrote to Timothy, and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And he only has one kingdom. And salvation is not like a mountain, like some describe, where different people are climbing up different sides of the mountain. But in the end, if they can reach the pinnacle, then they'll find God. No. Nope. There is only one mountain, but it's Jesus Christ. And... He alone is the one that can grant life when it says that life is in him and his son. He alone grants that life. Apart from him, none will have eternal life. They might have physical life, but not eternal. And only those for whom Christ died will enjoy that life through his death. This is why it's such a fallacy for preachers to say, well, Christ died for everybody, and now it's up to each individual to appropriate his death to themselves. When was the last time you saw a dead man appropriating anything to himself? Imagine going into the morgue and standing over a cadaver and saying, okay, now, if you really want life, you've got to appropriate it. We're here to help you, but you've got to do your part. How foolish. But somehow people continue to want to believe that in man, though dead, there's still some flame that if that sinner will just exercise his will, and the question is, what will? He's dead. That's how he's born in this world. And the only ones that God ever grants life to is for those that he gave to his son, and therein is our assurance that everyone that Christ died to pay their debt, that life is given through his blood, through his death. And it's by him then that they enter into God's presence. I know this message is very controversial and offensive because it, strikes against the very ego of man because man wants to think that somehow God has done all he can do but now the rest is up to you if you ever hear a preacher say that stand up and yell liar and run because that man does not know God if God were to do all that he could do and lay you at the door of salvation and all you had to do was reach up and turn the door handle, you couldn't. There would be no salvation because you're dead. You take a dead body, you move it from here and put it over there, it's dead. It takes the very spirit of God. But that's an offense to man because man likes to think that somehow, and that goes all the way back to the fall when Satan tempted Adam and Eve and made them think that somehow if they ate of that tree of the light, of the knowledge of good and evil, that they would be as God. Well, they understood once they partook of the difference between good and evil, 
but they were brought to see that what they thought would be good was actually evil. And the only good that can come from it is if God's pleased in his grace to grant life to such sinners. But this is not saying here that Christ is one of the ways to God. He says, here I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. He's the truth. He's the life. You know, for lost sheep, and that's who Scripture describes those that Christ came to save. He is the way. He's not standing there calling the sheep to hopefully find their way back. No, he is the way. He goes to where they are and puts them on his shoulder and brings them into the fold. If you're the Lord's, that's how he brought you. For lost sheep, sheep are dumb. They're in darkness and ignorance. That's how we're born in this world. But he's the truth. And when he's pleased to reveal himself in your heart, you'll know him as the truth. That's what Christ said. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There's no greater freedom for those who at one time had been in darkness and ignorance. Now to have their eyes open to see Christ and have life in him, because that's what it takes. It takes life to see. And for any sheep that are spiritually dead, they're dead, that means unable to come. So it takes Christ, who is the life. It takes his resurrection life to draw each one of those sheep. Now in light of the soon events here that Christ was facing because from here forward, John 13 all the way to the end of John he's preparing them for his death these are the messages that he left with his disciples this would this declaration then would seem to be a paradox because the Jews though they were looking for a Messiah they weren't looking for one to be crucified and so that's the paradox here. When Christ says, I am the way, he's saying the way is the way of the cross. That he would literally be convicted by blatant liars and that his own body would soon lie lifeless in a tomb. And you can see how unless God grants eyes to see, you look at that and think this man was an imposter. That's the way they would have thought about him. If he really was life, how could you put him to death? Well, God didn't die on the cross. The man did. He was the sacrifice. That's why a body was prepared for him. But it was necessary that he die in order that upon satisfaction of God's law and justice by his death that he should live, rise again. And that that death would be the death of every one the Father gave him, and his life would be their life. That's why Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, what? I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by what? The faith of the Son of God. Not your faith in the Son of God, but the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So that seems like a paradox to people of the world because they think, well, he died, he rose again, now it's up to us to appropriate his work. No, from beginning to end, Christ is the originator of the life, he's the author of it, he's the giver of it, he's the sustainer of it. Life is in him. And because he took that way to the cross, that's how he had to work this out all the way to the cross. It wouldn't have been enough for him to live a perfect life and then ascend into heaven and then say to his followers, now do the best you can. Can you imagine? That would leave them in no better state. In fact, a worse state than had he not come at all because they would have had some hope and then now to realize that in the end it was up to them anyway. He's the life. He's the way 
to God. He didn't contest with the lies of those who crucified him. He submitted himself unto death according to the will of his father, knowing that through his death, life would be granted. But without this way, that's what he's talking about here in John 14, 6, as the way, without that way of going to the cross, there would be no going to God. And without the truth, there would be no knowing, someone said. Without the way, no going. Without the truth, no knowing. And without the life, there would be no living. It all comes back to who Christ is, where he said, I am the way. And he's the one that, he doesn't just show the way, he is the way. He says, I am the truth. He's not just showing us the truth. He's the revealer of the truth as who he is. And without him giving life, there wouldn't be any hope. That's why he says here, except that no one comes to the Father except through me. Not just Christ making the way possible. I hear people interpreting it that way. See, Christ has made the way possible for you. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. But now you must follow. Well, if that were the case, then none would come. When he made this remarkable statement here, claiming that he was the only way to God, he was declaring that he is the exclusive way. That's the word, a word that people today don't like to hear. They don't like to hear Christ alone. Sorry to talk about Christ, but let me add my will to it. Let me add my endeavors to it. Let me add my determination. Nope. He's the exclusive way. He's the exclusive truth and the exclusive life to such a point where back here in John chapter 5 and verse 44, he said, how can ye believe? He said that to the Pharisees, which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only. How can you believe? But then, then over in John 6 and verse 44, he declared again, no man can come to me except the Father has sent which hath sent him, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. How can he say that except for life is in him? And again, he says there in verse 65, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me. What does it take to come? It takes life. Dead bodies don't come of their own. No, it takes life. And except it were given unto him of my father. That pretty much settles the matter, doesn't it? If any that do come, it's the father that gave them to the son. And you talk about it being controversial. Even in Christ's day, it says in verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back. It's not those that were true disciples, but professed disciples went back and walked no more with him. And that's when Jesus said unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? And Peter answered, Lord, to whom will we go? Here it is. Thou hast the words of eternal life. Thou hast them. That means they're in you. To whom shall we go? So nobody can come unto God except not just that Christ gives them that opportunity or that option, but he authorizes You've seen those doors and businesses, authorized personnel only. If you're not authorized personnel, you're not going in there. And so understood plainly, even though this is one of the more controversial things that Christ has ever said and the gospel writer wrote, yet it is the only way. And it is consistent with everything we know about God that apart from his son coming, living, dying, rising again, and sending on high, there is no salvation. And apart from his spirit giving life to reveal Christ in the heart and soul of those that he died to save, they're, they won't come. That's why people continue to follow their religion. 
They're happy with it because they love dead works, just like that raven that went out to and fro, feeding off of carcasses and cadavers. That's all people are doing. They might land somewhere where they mention the name of Christ or even open this Bible and read it, but when you hear how they define Christ, really, Christ is set forth as somebody who came to show the way. He's not the way. He shows the way. Now you have to follow. It's not what the scriptures say. It's not a matter of personal opinion. I get people saying that all the time to me. Well, it's just a matter of personal opinion. That's your opinion. It's not opinion. What saith the Lord? And uh, the scriptures are clear. People call you bigoted. I've heard that so many times, bigoted. Well, I'd rather be that sinner that lays at Christ's feet knowing that my only hope is in the life that he died to give me and by his spirit has given me. And thereby I stand accepted in him. What a glorious truth that we have here of Christ, the life. Apart from him, there is none. 